We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up, bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of all elite wrestling. I am Aubrey Edwards. What is my name? Aubrey Edwards. <laughs> okay, yes. Here with my wonderful good friend William Washington <laughs> that is me although that's the first time you've said well that's the first time it's the first time I've ever William said William it felt weird yeah. I'm gonna go back this is my friend Will Washington <laughs> <laughs> whatever it's fine it's whatever it's what's it's on fine the- it's whatever but you know what's what's fine and not whatever that was a terrible segue but I just want to talk about the fact that we're now in August and freaking London is like right around the corner it is last year was crazy right like 81,035 people insane but who's counting excuse (laughs) the fact that we're now doing cardiff wales and dynamite as well dynamite and collision it's crazy that like somehow and we say it all the time that like we just keep getting better right it just keeps getting bigger and it's crazy that this is like such a colossal beast of a machine (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to think mm-hmm. of where we were five years ago and to think like now we're doing, oh, we're doing multiple shows in the UK this month. This month is crazy. I leave for literally like Scotland in like 17 days. This is freaking wild. Yeah. Uh, no, I honestly, I, the big thing that kind of bummed me out last year was that I just didn't get to spend enough time in London and to know that, you know, we've got the show in Cardiff now. And so I'm going to be there from Tuesday through Monday, uh, the whole six days. And I'm, I'm really excited about everything we're going to get to do um, from the media side of things to the wrestling side of things. Like this just feels so much bigger than it did last year. And I'm so excited for it. Yeah, it's insane because it's one of those things we live, like even though we travel every week and we're in all these different parts of the countries and seeing the AEW fan base is so great, but realizing that there's these people on the other side of the ocean that are such dedicated fans and that this is like their time to come and support, it's just like a a feeling unlike anything else. And I am so excited for literally everyone at AEW who gets to go on this trip to just experience that because it's a completely unreal thing including like some of the some of the new people we have joining aew like who do we got today will well aubrey we're actually joined by uh aew's newest signee uh i think it's the newest right i don't think we've signed anybody you're the one that knows you. everything how do you i know i'm just, <laughs> i know i'm trying to think about this like have we signed anybody either way one of <laughs> aew's newest signees our new go. fabulous interviewer and host alicia toot Alicia, thank a you for toot, being here. With a tout. Us. <laughs> oh my goodness! It, literally, since I started doing anything in wrestling, a tout, a two, a toot. Like no one knows, and they're almost scared to say a toot, which is the way it's said because you know it sounds a little funny. But yes, tis me. Thank you so much for having me. I like a toot because it feels very Canadian, right? Kind of like a toot, a tout le monde, a tout, a tout le monde. <laughs> See, it's perfect. <laughs> it's like anytime you ask a Canadian like what they're going to do in wrestling, and they say, "I'm going to throw a boot," and it always sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah. I can't go anywhere down here just speaking normally without people pointing something out. And now I know how much I say A all the time. Egg. Like that's what brought to my attention. Oh egg gosh. Melt melt. Egg. Yeah. All Milk. Wrong. Yeah. Oh now, yeah. That said, I actually I, I got the the pronouncing your last name wrong out of my system like five years ago because you know you actually been around quite some time yes. um and you actually were uh, a part of the original double or nothing and so i want to bring kind of everything full circle with you first off how did you officially become all elite how long had that been in the works Ooh. i mean it's something we were definitely discussing last year and then come around the summertime leading right into early fall we discussed details and then we were able to put pen to paper closer to i'd say winter time without getting too specific but it's something that we were discussing for a minute i feel like it's something that's been up in the air being discussed for like five years so that's really cool for me for this to have come full circle to not have only done the first two ever shows in terms of all in of course pre the AEW brand but to do all in and then double or nothing years ago and now to actually be signed it, it feels so full circle very surreal and i remember the moment they put the graphic up on the website that was officially a part of the roster. 
I got a message from from my dad. And he was like, "Hey, look at this bun!" I'm like, yeah, bun. <laughs> Oh, oh, more Canadian references. I love it. We're going to get a lot of them. Prepare yourselves. I'm so excited. You have no idea. I love everything and anything Canadian. Every time we go there, I'm like, yes, this is great. This is why you and I, I have it. become such good friends for other reasons as well. But I just happen to love it. It's only because I'm Canadian. I only because, yeah, I only had room in my friend circle for any Canadians. Americans, like, no, we're, we're full up. Sorry. <laughs> There's a waiting list. <laughs> Anyway, on the topic of like joining, uh, being there for the first AEW events, like what was it like for you? Like, do you have a favorite memory from that first AEW pay-per-view from Double or Nothing, oh like way gosh. back in 2019? Yeah. So for me, it was really interesting because I was backstage knowing I'd have a couple of promos to do for the company, but then I was also able to do my freelance stuff and just walk around backstage, interview talent. And that's kind of what got me into wrestling to begin with, just in terms of being in the wrestling industry. I've been a fan since I was like three, but one of my favorite parts, um, there were two that stick out. One is interviewing Pharaoh, because that was just hilarious to me. Um, I love any type of, uh, any any little fur baby. And so that was great. And fans went nuts. So like, she's crazy enough to interview a dog. I'm like, yes, yes, mm -hmm. I am. So that was great. Um, and then another one was the promo I did with Omega. There was 10,000 people there, you know, and I was just so excited because it was the biggest audience at that point in time that I was able to showcase something in front of. And we did this promo and it was it was kind of ridiculous because I usually wear flats in the back. I'm like five, six and a half on a good day, five, seven. And so they'll always make me wear flats when interviewing people. And so I had these flats, like I'm getting into position to do this stance where you kind of split your legs so you're even shorter and you know the drill. And oh, I'm getting ready to, to do thing. it. <laughs> they look at me, my producer at that time and, and Penny, and they go, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing the interview thing. Like, you want me to look short? And they're going, nah, nah, nah. So they intentionally pan to me and my flip flops in the promo and come back up. And which is like this really cute inside type of thing. And I loved it. So those are, those are two of the things that stand out the most. But it was just a whirlwind of the night for everybody. Because I had so many friends on that show, too, that were just itching to have a moment. And they got it that night. So it, it was, oh, it was crazy. Well, you talked about kind of it being a, a long time coming being five years you know you talked about first double or nothing and of course your experiences at the first all in but in the meantime in late 2019 you actually signed with uh mlw why was that the best fit and opportunity for you at that time yeah so at that moment i was talking to a couple of different companies and some things were drawn out some people weren't were getting back sometimes so there were just a lot of moving parts and it got to the point where i took a breath I'm like, all right, I'm very flattered that so many people want to work with me because you always have that little doubt in your head where you're like, why does that, it, it's a confidence booster, but at the same time, you have that feeling of like, me? You know, because in my head, I'm still that Canadian from the small town who's like finally trying to make a name for herself within the States. And that, that's, that wasn't easy. So when they approached me, they made it very obvious that they wanted me to be a part of their team, especially at that point in time. Their roster was so cool. I remember looking backstage and just seeing so many faces. I got one of my best friends out of it being Selena De Laurenta. And, um, you know, it's, I just remember thinking, this is friendly. This is me. And they gave me so much creative freedom. Like anytime that camera was on. So they, they flew me out to a New York show. It was one of their bigger pay-per-views. And they flew me out. They're like, let's just try, let's see how this goes. Let's get this trial and, and error this. And then within five minutes, they were like, all right, let's talk. Let's talk. We want to sign you. <laughs> and so I just felt appreciated. And it wasn't that I didn't feel that way out, elsewhere, but some spots were just happening slower. I'm like, you know what? At that point, I was in my mid-20s. may have been like 24. I said, screw it. Let's let's just do it. And so I put pen to paper and it was just it was so fun. It was so much fun. It gave me a taste of what it would be like. It was, you know, being on the road only a few days out of the month. So it's like dipping your toes in, but not quite what we do, which is literally woo, all the time, every single week, which I love to. But this was my little like introduction and they let me have a lot of creative freedom there. And I, I really did learn a lot in terms of television because I had been with Impact before and done stuff, but it was it was kind of different. That was more so here's your script, say your words, cool. With MLW as more of a character and that was a blast. I'm curious because as as Will kind of alluded to, like you have a very long history in wrestling. Like you're the the interview queen and you were all over the indies. So how do you go from someone who's been watching wrestling since they were three to building sort of the name for yourself and a reputation for yourself as this incredible interviewer on the indies? Thank you. For me, I started doing the music stuff 
And then once I kind of had the Metallicas and Dua Lipas under my belt, again, I, I'm going to keep throwing to him because he was kind of like the data jerk at the time. But my dad came up to me and he goes, your, your channel's doing really well. You love wrestling. Why don't we try to break into this other market? And I was so freaked out because I'm like, oh my gosh, are my music fans going to comprehend this? Is anyone going to care? Am I just going to fizzle out now? Some completely changing industries. It ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. So I end up at this local show in Toronto. I head down to this promotion. I lined up three or four interviews, knocked them out back to back. And I just, it felt different, but it felt so much fun because I got to work off of something different. With musicians, it's very much like, hello, let's just talk about the tour, the music, your hobbies. But with wrestling, you're given such characters, obviously. And for me, that was just a blast to work off of. Just an absolute blast. So yeah, I just realized, hey, I dig this. I can I can make some coin off of it. And I was doing every, you know, local promotion in Canada. And then it just blossomed in, into other stuff. And I love I loved every second. Okay, well, from one person who's been doing this a really long time to somebody else who's been doing this a very long time. Uh, I, I want to ask you specifically about the music side of things, because you started very young there. And I say this as somebody who el somebody else who also started at this at 17. But you did start your music blog at 17, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. So what was the drive for that? Like, I know you can kind of have I, I at least for me, I remember that that feeling of like, I know what I want to do and I know I want to, to use whatever ability I have. Uh, and it's like fresh out of high school and it's like, I got to do something. Was it, was it kind of similar for you in that vein? So it was my last year, year and a half of high school. I applied to a bunch of schools, was accepted for journalism. And I just realized the courses they were kind of trying to push down our throats was let's write about, about car crashes and things that would be headline news, but nothing that was kind of an entertainment. And it was really hard to get your foot in the door in terms of journalism within music. So I said, screw it, I'm going to reject the acceptances, which sounded nuts and I was terrified. And I didn't go to, to post-secondary out of high school. And I just started going to gigs. I just went to so many concerts. And organically, I was at a show with, with my parents and my sister. It was a band called Bombay Bicycle Club. Bless them, first interview I ever did. Um, I was literally thrown into the situation. And I asked two questions that were completely random. I was shaking, nervous, like, why am I doing this? At that point, my, my blog, the music blog, yeah, website, was only album reviews, concert reviews, nothing in interacting with anybody. I threw it up on YouTube. People really dug it. And then I realized whoa, is this a way to not pay like $400 for a meet and greet, get to meet my favorite bands and get free concert tickets at 17? And that's honestly the drive. That was the driving force. Well, because <laughs> at that point, you are a teenager. You, you aren't making, or I at the time wasn't making anything from it. So it was just me typing to the internet. And then YouTube was what kind of boom, pushed, pushed it up. But yeah, it was it was the free concert tickets and just meeting my idols. That meant everything <laughs> to me. I'm such a music nerd. <laughs> it's like the first time that you're like, you have a bit of a social media following and a company reaches out to you and it's like, hey, do you want this free product to shill it like on a reel? And you're like, oh, people are giving me stuff for free. Like your, your understanding of the world and like what you actually can get out of it is so small and it changes. And it's like the 17 year old mindset of like, oh, I get free concert tickets. Like, of course, that's what you're working for. Yeah. Like, absolutely. That's thousands of dollars a month. Thousands right. of dollars at the time that I did not have, nor if I did want to spend on concerts, like, like that's crazy. You're trying to save at that age. So for me, it was like, ooh, five nights a week, different gigs for free. Let's go. <laughs> right. And at this, at the time, you're just trying to break even. So it's actually like hugely beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. I honestly relate to that so hard, by the way, because like for me, it was one of those things where getting into journalism, the hard thing is, especially when you're 17. They want you to cover so many things that center around sadness. And you don't want to be sad, right? Like, you just don't. You know, you don't want to cover tragedies. You don't want to cover any of that stuff. Like, you just want to talk mm -hmm. about fun shit. And, like, for me, it was, like, video games and tech. That was, like, the thing I wanted to cover and then somehow ended up in wrestling. And, like, so mm -hmm. I understand that with music where it's, like, yeah, there's always going to be, like, sad stories around music. But for the most part, as long as the music itself is the subject, that's where you get to still continue to have fun with it. And so, like, I get that and I fully understand that. And that's honestly when you're 17 and to be able to just get into it and get to see free concerts and uh, get to talk to your favorite artists. Like, how cool is that? Like, that is the coolest thing. Yeah. 
I felt like I was living the dream. And then you have bands who were like, hey, you, and, it, and it was interesting. Like I dealt with my fair share of extremely creepy scenarios. And that's why my dad was my cameraman. Oh, yeah. Cause I did not want to put myself in those situations, but I had so many people I loved who genuinely and sweetly were like, oh my gosh, come to this next show. Here are the tickets. That was such a great interview. We can't wait to see you again. And at first I'm just thinking to myself, all right, they're just saying kind things because I'm around. But then I would see them and interview them. I'd have interview round four, round five with with a lot of very cool groups. And I just, it was such a community that I loved and still love so much. And this is before, you know, all the wrestling stuff, which just really opened my mind to how huge the world is and how many people are out there. But yeah, the music stuff is definitely where, where my heart goes to because of just the nostalgia and it shaped me. I was so quiet. I was I was very reserved. I was bullied like crazy as a kid. So I kind of suppressed a lot of my outgoing qualities and how blunt I am as a person. And then in these interviews, I just got to I just got to speak my mind, ask people questions and get on with, with humans, other human beings. And I I loved that psychology and, and just getting to know people. So very grateful for those those teen years. So good. I mean, the it's already like a huge start and there's so much more to talk about. But we will talk about it after we take a quick break here on AEW Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey, Will, and Alicia, we are chatting about, uh, I guess, coming from getting your start in sort of the music business interview set and then eventually moving to wrestling. But I'm kind of curious, and maybe this is more of like an advice for people who are listening in and kind of interested in doing something like this themselves. Like, what would you say was the biggest struggle taking the jump from doing album reviews and whatnot on your blog to eventually going towards like, I'm going to go and interview these bands that are really big? What's the big jump there that maybe people don't see? Like, what work was involved there? Um, for me, the it was terrifying just because of the fear of rejection. Oh, absolutely. I was- balls to the wall reaching out to every manager every top name that was within music and I was so scared because I knew a lot of them were going to get back to me I was 17 I wasn't you know I'd show up to some of these in like a band t-shirt and jeans which is totally fine but then you know I come up with like the shiny t-zone and and the my little pimples and I'm like that that reference went directly over Will's head (laughs) (laughs) completely it's it's a makeup thing I'll tell you later yeah no I I was just gonna let you guys go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm still self-conscious about the shiny teas on by the way. Like I have a huge light on me and I'm like, I swear it's just the light. It's just it's, the light. It's, uh... But it's the thing that stick with you when you're younger. So there were so many things to me where deep down, I didn't want to be rejected by these people. Even though strangers, I didn't want the nose in my inbox. I didn't want to wake up and see, no, we, we don't think you're good enough yet to talk to our talents, whatever it may be. And then it was once again, the dad who had a talk with me because I was supposed to break the hell down. And he goes, it doesn't matter how many no's you get. All it takes is the one yes. And I was like, holy shit, that's prolific. Like that is the wisdom. <laughs> so I took that to heart. I still do to this day. Um, Cause even now at, you know, 29, we still get rejection. It's how you deal with it. And you wait for that one. Yes. And then finally I started getting guesses back. I reached out sending blind emails to Warner Music, Sony Music, Universal, and all of them wrote me back randomly because they heard about this girl who was going out to clubs that she wasn't even old enough to get into half of the time, interviewing four to five bands in a night, five to six days a week. And I was just trying to get my reps in, trying to not shake, not talk quickly because I started interviewing like, hey guys, it's Alicia too. Welcome to my channel. It's so great to have you here because I was so scared and so nervous. And you don't know. You don't know when you're young. You don't know how to present. You're just thrown into a thing that you love and you just, you get better at it. So what I would say is just don't be scared of that rejection because one day you're going to get a yes. And that yes literally will change everything. And it won't come right away. It won't. But if you show face, you got a network to get work and you get your ass out there, there's a way better chance of something happening than if you don't do it at all. So you got to know who cares. Yeah. So let good. that let that bitterness drive you because damn did it drive me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious. Do you have or at least what would you say is your most unbelievable interview story? Oh man. This is tricky because there are a lot of interviews where until the moment you show up and see the artist walk through the door, you're worried that they're just gonna pull the plug on you and not get it. So for me, I remember sitting there 
shaking, waiting for my interview with Robert Chihulo from Metallica. And I am just waiting for him to come through the door. We saw Lars in the hallway. And I'm like, oh, I think it's happening. I know they're in the building. <laughs> and he walks through the door, introduces himself, one of the greatest bass players and one of the biggest bands of all time. And he goes, ready to rock and roll? Sits beside me, grabs the mic. He comments the branding on the microphone, which I DIY'd myself. My little mic flag was an Ambi at the time. And I just, I just remember looking across from him thinking, holy shit, I got to nail this. Otherwise, like, I'm done. And the interview was 15 minutes long, so I just kept them short and sweet. I had praise from everyone who was on his team. He loved it. And I just remember I was able to breathe. So for me, that was probably one of the most just reassuring interviews I ever did. But I've done stuff where, like, I've had people lick the side of my face. I've been kicked in the crotch. I've been berated on stage. Like I've gone through everything when it comes to interviewing in wrestling and music. So yeah, there's, there's a lot that's gone down. So on that topic, and you kind of mentioned your, your dadager and your uh, dad cameraman and whatnot. I'm sure that you face a lot of difficult situations purely just for being a woman yeah. in this space. Right. And you kind of casually mentioned it that like your dad ends up being your cameraman just purely from like a protective standpoint, which is so incredibly smart that like, you know, you have someone there who has your best interests in mind, who when you're in these clubs that you're not old enough to get into, it's like, good, you have someone who's looking out for you because that's incredibly important. Yeah. Did he have a particular background in like managing or camera work? Or was it just a more of a like just trying to be a supportive dad to his daughter that he loves? So it was an interesting combo. Definitely the latter would be more what we'd lean towards, but he was actually in a band with his brother for like five years in the nineties. And so he was the one who was taking all their demos, putting them into little packages and mailing them out to all of these different record companies, because at the time, you know, there, there was no internet. <laughs> so he was already in that like manager grind for his band. So when he saw what I was trying to do, at 17, he's like, all right, well, at first I'll, I'll help you understand like where to allocate your finances and where to put stuff. I'll help you understand how to approach this to, to craft like the perfect email. He helped me out so much. And my mom did too. My mom was wildly supportive. And before this, we would all go to gigs together. Like we're just such a close tight knit family. It was never weird to me to, to be around my dad. And I thought anyone who wanted to judge that they're the weird ones because they got stuff, they got to sort of, you know? So that's where my mindset was. But he just jumped in full force and he got to see so many gigs um, for free as well. And he got to meet so many wrestling heroes that he loved over time. Like having him in the back and seeing his face look around, he's like, oh my gosh, that's Scott Hall. That's, oh, she just interviewed Scott. That's my daughter talking to Scott Hall. Or the, or the moment <laughs> like the Mick Foley, like, hosting the 20 Years of Hell tour for Mick Foley. And it got to the point where I was old enough where I didn't need him by my side, but I just wanted him there because I knew how much it meant to him. And these are memories he'll cherish for forever. And then I'll go to gigs still, be backstage, and people still see me like, how's your dad? That's cool. You know, like, that's a cute little thing. And I'll cherish that forever. Because they're memories that we formed. And I love the fact that we'll, we'll always have that. He traveled to me to the first All In, you oh, know? Awesome. He was the one filming those those interviews with the Bucks and, I mean, like, Mysterio at the time. And there was just, there were so many cool things. So I'll always, I'll always have that in there. Your interviewees, or were your interviewees, I should say, at least aware at the time? Or is it one of those things that, like, you can pop out and surprise and, like, haha, I'm her dad? <laughs> Never prefaced it. <laughs> I also didn't want them to be weird about it in, in holding back good moments for the interview. Sure. So if they thought, oh, that's her dad, we wouldn't get maybe a cheeky moment. I don't mean a flirtatious moment, just, like, a cheeky moment. Or maybe they wouldn't bring up a story that's batshit crazy because, like, oh, her father's there. Like, a great example is I interviewed a band called Steel Panther. They are this like mock metal band who are balls to the wall, so politically incorrect, wild party animals. Like they're just, they're nuts. And I've interviewed them so many times now, but in the first interview, it was so crazy. And they were saying so many things that just should have never been said in the best way possible. And I'm like, if I mentioned that my father was here, I don't know if we would have gotten such great sound bites and moments and, and banter, you know, cause you play into it. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a, 50 year old rocker who starts complimenting on your outfits and everyone's in on the joke and then you go back and forth on it like they're not going to do that if they know he's behind the camera and my dad knows I'm the one who's it's a gig it's a job we're just all playing around so yeah I, w I wouldn't ever lead into it but people eventually you let them know <laughs> <laughs> that's great you had mentioned in there the Mick Foley 20 years of hell spoken word tour yeah how did you end up getting that gig oh my gosh so I had interviewed Foley 
that was the nerdiest oh my gosh I've ever done in my life. Did you? Oh my god! <laughs> but it's just it's, it's <laughs> next I have to point that out before everyone's all over. I've always been a fan of Mick Foley, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. That match in specific is my first, and I feel like it's for a lot of people, especially around my age bracket, but that's my first memory of professional wrestling. I was three years old, sat on the couch, parents by my side with a bunch of my dad's buddies, and they were watching him versus Taker. I remember the the gory ear, the tooth in the nose, like all these things. I'm like, what is this? I need more. And um, so I, I reached out to him years and years ago when I was in my early 20s starting wrestling stuff. And I just asked if I could interview him. He wrote me back. He said, sure. Um, he's like, oh, I have a daughter your age. Like, I think this would be great. It'd be so fun. And now Noel and I are friends, which is super funny, but like <laughs> very full circle. And so I do the interview. It goes great. I see him again years later, do another interview. I see him at conventions all the time. We just stayed in touch. He's one of the sweetest, most caring human beings I've ever met. Then I get I get hit up. Hey, we're uh, we're thinking of doing a spoken tour, 20 Years of Hell. We're going to tour all across Canada and would love to pitch you being that, that girl to open the show and welcome Mick on stage and warm the crowd up. And I, you know, when you get emails and it says someone's name, you're like, this has to be spam. Like, go away. This isn't true. It was. And so next thing you know, I'm uh, opening shows for him. We're celebrating this big moment in wrestling history. It was historic. And I got to be a little part of that. So that was wicked. And you know what? I think I want to take a quick break because uh, there's a, a bit of an elephant in the room question that I have to get to. But I feel like I will ask Ooh. that <laughs> right here when AEW Unrestricted continues. AEW Unrestricted. This is Will Washington. It's Aubrey Edwards. Alicia. I'm going to ask about Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Ugh. MJF. Do we have to? Kinda. I like that um, that says everything while saying very little <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> it's very interesting how, as it played out in front of everybody, there was this contentious relationship between the two of you that seemed to bud into a bit of an adoration. It's one way to put it. Yes, yes. How can this be? <laughs> I, I have known Maxwell Jacob Friedman since we were both in our early 20s. I believe he was 20 and I was 21 when we first met. We had a lot of back and forth, a lot of interviews, a lot of very ridiculous, ridiculous moments together from him kicking me in my vagine to me slapping him across the face. Yes, yes. So one would wonder, how did two people over the span of seven and a half years uh, come to where we are now? <laughs> he is just so annoyingly persistent that he just <laughs> he just bogged me down and bogged me down. And he always says in, in promos and when addressing the audience, he uh, he gets everything that he wants. And that just so happened to, to be the case over here. So now uh, this is where we're at. And I can I can I get asked all the time. Is he how is he at home? How are, how is life with him? Is he really how he is on television? And I can point blank say that uh, he's a pain in my ass, guys, big time. Everything you see is the truth. I'm I'm very much enjoying the the the, the big home that he breaks about all of the time. And our cat Piper is a fabulous fabulous thing. The Porsche is a little much for me, but you know it makes it makes him happy. And when he's happy, he nags at me less so hey there you go just one day at a time you uh you find you find the happy moments amongst all the the fighting and bickering and frustration has it gotten worse or better since he became the international champion oh so much worse <laughs> all i hear about is how he's champion that's all I, it'll be like oh hey hey do you and i'll be like oh what do you need you know i'm an international champion i'm like just stop stop i get it <laughs> i'd be so happy and this is not me slating off anything because every single championship in this company, I love so dearly. And it's so cool to people get these championships. But if I never heard international championship again, I would just be so sorry. So. Oh, well, I am so sorry <laughs> for your current state. <laughs> me, too, me too. Me too. <laughs> I, I hope that because it seems like he's getting everything he wants. I just hope that you are getting everything that you want out of it. And it is more of a business partnership or a partnership in general rather than one-sided because I love you too much. Thank you. For him. I promise I have some self-worth. <laughs> there's some, there's some, there's somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. We have to dig for it. There, there's obviously. He's very funny. Give him that. Yeah. Look, there, there's obviously 
joy that comes here. There, there has to be. Here's the general question. What does a date night between Alicia and Max look like? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy, right? <laughs> he doesn't eat anywhere unless it's a Michelin star restaurant. So that, that's a joy that's come out of it. Okay. I mean, I love food. I love food. So we only dine at Michelin star restaurants, valets, fancy food, eight courses. So, you know, that's, that's been a treat. And then often we will frequent, because it's only only on cheat days does he ever break, because, you know, being a champion, he constantly is in the gym, constantly doing hours of Stairmaster every single day. The life of a champion now. That's a shoot, by the way. Every that is phone a shoot. conversation oh, I have I, with Max. I, I'm not lying once in this interview. <laughs> I know. Look, every phone conversation I have with Max, he's like, yeah, I'm on the Stairmaster right now. Like, he has to make sure that there's the person on the other side of the phone knows. There's one of them. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> anyway, it's... So we'll have those dinners, and then we always have to find some kind of ice cream or donuts afterwards. So oh. a date night involves a lot of eating, cuddling Piper, because although humanity has truly turned their back on Maxwell, and that was really hard for me to see the way that the fans turned on him like that, I'm I will back him up to the end of time on that. He he loves Piper dearly. It's it's the only time I really see uh, any living, breathing thing make him happy. So we'll Piper's cuddle Piper a lot. <laughs> Yeah, those are a, a typical date night. Oh man, I, I friggin' love it. Well, I'm happy for you. Are, are we happy? Can we be happy? We'll be happy. He forces me to say I'm happy. Okay, cool. All right, we'll uh, we'll <laughs> yes. move on now. <laughs> this has been fun. <laughs> um, so back to the interviewing stuff because <laughs> we were all happier then. <laughs> so I, I'm curious from your perspective, like you you were at AEW for the first two shows. And then a lot of time passed, and now you're back. Yeah. So what has been sort of the biggest change that you've seen Ooh. as someone who saw it from, like, the first few days? Crazy. Um, I mean, the roster's just grown into something that's why. Yeah, literally that. We'll explain it. If you are listening, we just all stretched our arms out to both ends. If you are watching, how do you, you saw it. But the roster's huge, and it's so diverse. And there are so many matchups, and that's why we keep getting these like dream matchups on television because you would never think five years ago that so many, especially international talents, but you would never think that you'd be able to have this melting pot of so many badass professional wrestlers. So for me, that's the coolest thing. Like I'm walking in the back and you're seeing legends to people who just got signed because they've only been in the industry for like six months, but they're crazy skilled. And there's just this, this wild crossover of so many different walks of life. And that's not me just blowing smoke up this company's booty. It's just cool for me to see as a wrestling fan, because I get to sit in the back and whether it's on in, in the locker room or talent view or whatever it is, I get to just watch wrestling. It's like the concert thing, you know, like we get to watch free wrestling every single week live. And that is the sickest thing. So I, I love that aspect. And for me, it has been such an interesting transition because I have known so many of these people for so as long as I've, I've known Maxwell, we've done so many indie shows together. So for me, it was interesting walking in rather than doing my freelance stuff for myself or going to the odd pay-per-view alongside Max to, to watch him in the ring, but to be there for, for me and to be asked, oh, hey, what's going on today? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm working here. <laughs> it is so weird in the best of ways. So I think those have been kind of the biggest mind screws and switches and surprises and just things that make me happy. Walking down those narrow hallways and seeing so many different types of personalities. We got it all. We really do. We have this titled Alicia to Quick Hits. <laughs> and there's one in particular because I saw you tweet this and there was nothing I related to harder. But you tweeted. Oh, no, <laughs> yes, I know you do. You tweeted, I tried to watch Friends. Instant regret. Why? What is it about Friends that's not for you? Well, first off, I'm really glad you came back. So thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just for those that are listening and not watching, I literally threw my pen and walked away. <laughs> literally walked away. So for me, I've always been a gigantic Seinfeld fan. Seinfeld fan. And the greatest. It's the greatest show. It's the greatest show of all time. Larry yeah. David for life. No comparison. Career enthused. Like, mm, love it all. But for me, I've always not understood why people have such was created hard on for friends and i've always kind of avoided it i've seen little bits of oh can i not say that i'm sorry no I'll you can totally that. say that i'm just like my husband on? smiled in the back because he's a big like seinfeld fan so he's oh, okay. probably getting a kick out of this okay awesome don't worry i'm only just beginning 
But for me, <laughs> I'll, I'll be at a hotel room at 2 a.m. and all they're playing is Friends or Seinfeld. And I've many times tried to watch, comprehend, get into Friends. I started from even the beginning instead of starting like at ep- episode 24 of season 60, uh, two minutes in, whatever it might be. So for me, I tried watching it genuinely a week ago and I just sat there waiting <laughs> and waiting. <laughs> And waiting for a joke or something to make me laugh or feel something. And I felt nothing. It was a void of emotion. And it just made me frustrated because I was actually trying for the first time. Um, going all in. I even had like the best snacks ready. I was I was prepared. But I just couldn't get I couldn't get into it. And then I, I put on an episode of Caribbean Enthusiasm. Um for me there's this there's this wit, this cheekiness, this very like quick writing this political incorrectness to to all Larry David pieces that I just bite into because again I mentioned my bitter side how I can be kind of blunt and stern and I'm never rude but you'll you'll always get me honest and if I don't want to be honest with you I won't say anything at all (laughs) it's better for everybody so I just love that about Curb and Seinfeld so I I really did try it was a very confrontational tweet (laughs) <laughs> seriously i was like oh i'm gonna start getting the death threats guys this is getting kind of serious you know and I, I see that jokingly but also i've gotten death threats over like less wild things so you know internet's great oh yeah but i i tried that's all i'm gonna say i tried it wasn't a success ld forever social assassin for the win that's my that's my bet. i feel like it comes down to the fact that like friends was a very good in the moment in time There was something about in the 90s where comedy was just a bunch of people yelling at each other and it's whoever yelled the last that got the laugh track. Whereas I feel like the Larry David stuff kind of ages better. So ultimately like it's a better quality show because there's nothing really funny about someone saying, could I be wearing any more clothes? But like for some reason we thought that was great. So Well, I'm going to let that point stand because I adore you dearly and (laughs) you like the W on that and believe you. Okay. Do you have a go-to Seinfeld episode? Like, is there one where you can just, Ooh. you're in a bad mood and you just throw that one on? I have my answer, but I'm curious what yours is. So, so okay. Okay. before so you answer, I'm going to rephrase this question. Yeah. I've never yeah. gotten into Seinfeld. <gasps> I've tried. Like, it's, I'm, I'm in the same boat, but in the opposite way, right? Like, so, <laughs> my husband keeps okay. looking at me like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there like an episode that you would tell someone like, if they're trying to get into it, like, watch this one. In my opinion, one of the most iconic ones is the Soup Nazi. Soup Nazi is very... It's fantastic. The way that he writes, you will have 40 storylines going on. It's, I mean, if you're a wrestling fan, especially, like, that, it's the same kind of thought process where there's so many lo- storylines and synchronicities going on, and you're only focusing on one at a time, and in the end, they all so perfectly and seamlessly blend together and you go convert they do you go holy shit like that is crazy. the whole armor thing like everything yes. about that episode everything. like the way it all comes together is so perfect i could agree with that one when she's at the end slamming him on the table just giving it to him like it's perfectly next written so good so good and um ooh, okay let me think about the black and white cookie i forever fabulous i literally put oh, this yeah. on today and i was like Oh, tribute to Jer, because it's the puppy shirt. So that's another good episode. <laughs> yeah, the puppy shirt. The puppy shirt's yeah. really, really yeah. good. I'm blanking on the title of this episode, and I feel really terrible about it because I just love Seinfeld that much. But there's the episode where the fire happens and they need George's code and he refuses to give his code. Oh my God, Bosco. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. This, great episode. Yeah. Oh, so good. So those <laughs> great are episode. I'll text them to you so you Please. can watch them afterwards. <laughs> Because, like, my answer is, like, really difficult because it's, it's like, if you don't know the characters, it, it would be hard to get into. But if you know the characters, I feel like the engagement is genuinely, like, the so best good. episode, the like, contest, of television. Spare Square, those yeah. are good, too. Like, great. Yeah. Yeah. I, just think- I love the engagement because it's, like, it, it's such a boiling point for so much of what you know about the characters, yeah. right? Because it's, like... George breaks up with a woman who beat him at chess, <laughs> and Jerry breaks up with a woman who eats her peas one by one. And like these <laughs> characters that are so neurotic, it's so like big children. And then when okay. they realize this about themselves, and they come to the conclusion that we need to grow up, you're literally and describing George is like, you know what? Okay, I, th- I think that's changed so my mindset on it's, this. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> the crazy thing about Seinfeld, as much as we relate to every single one of them, I've had so many long long conversations with people like who are you most like out of the Seinfeld cast 
And you shouldn't want to be like any of them because in the grand scheme of things, they're terrible human <laughs> beings. But they have these little all of, them. all of them. But they have these weird, quirky, redeeming qualities. Whether the self-loathing of George to like the the cruel, blunt wit of of Elaine. Even even um, my favorite with Jerry is how specific he is about things and why he'll break up with people. So, like the girl who had two faces, the girl with the big hands, the uh, the close <laughs> talker, the quiet talker. Like he's so particular. And I love that because all of us have these qualities, just not to the extent that they do. So for me, it's just, I feel like they took the worst of me and put them into all these characters. And I'm just, I just eat it up and I fucking love it. (laughs) I, I feel like so listening to you describe why you love Seinfeld is a very clear indicator of why you're such a good interviewer. You're able to understand who people are, what makes them tick. You're able to connect with them on a different level, all of these different things. And I'm just so happy that you're here at AEW, finally, officially. And I love get that I get to see you every single week. And it's been amazing. That is so nice. Like, I genuinely feel the same. It's very neat for me to to walk backstage and see the familiar faces I've known for so long and, and not just be a, oh, hey, good to see you again, but be a weekly thing now where there's this this camaraderie and I have a really hard hard time trusting people, um, which goes back to the bullying thing. And for me to find these people where for my weekly home on the road, I can go to and have that sisterhood and that brotherhood is really cool. And it's something I've wanted for a really long time. And now it's here. So Yay. yeah, I'm just really happy to, to have a wrestling home and to keep crushing these backstage promos and take whatever opportunities are thrown my way and continue to grow. Cause like I've been on television in a minute, especially on this scale. So for me, the social stuff has been great. Whatever's to come will be great. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm happy. Well, we are so happy to have you. And you can see Alicia Toot on an AEW program near you. You can follow AEW social and you will definitely make sure that you see more Alicia there. Alicia, thank you for being here. Uh, You can follow AEW Unrestricted wherever you get your podcast. We have new episodes available every Thursday. We have video episodes available on our YouTube channel every Monday. Of course, All Elite Wrestling is all over your television. We've got AEW Dynamite every Wednesday on TV. We've got AEW Rampage every Friday night on TNT, AEW Collision every Saturday on TNT. Plus, you've got Ring of Honor available every Thursday on Honor Club. I'm Will Washington. She's Aubrey Edwards. Our guest, Alicia Toot. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Peace. Come on, throw your hands up. Let me see you. Unrestricted.